think it was pretty much a numbers game, right? As you said, there were like 20 of us boys down the neighborhood, but there were what, you and your sisters, yeah. and I can't remember any other girls in the yeah, area, right? So. Girls, yeah. <laughs> but you were not uh, particularly ambitious, I would say, as a, as a young person. <laughs> uh, so how did this change come? Because I, I, you grew up, then you went abroad, and then suddenly you came back as this like very high-flying <laughs> economist. So what happened in the interim period? <laughs> Odd story. So my first day at, uh, at Haley, so I went in thinking, okay, I'm going to be the economist for the group. And then I get my visiting cards, and the visiting card says financial analyst, and I was like, "What? What's that?" <laughs> um, but at which point, uh, in the sense, like at what point did you start digging into Sri Lanka's history, into like mm. how we got here? No, you're right. I mean, uh, you just uh, probably after when I actually started working, that I had a more, say, constructive engagement in uh, um, in matters relating to policy and economic policy in in, um, in particular. If there was a change in government, uh, do you think that? Any other government could bring these changes about? I think the problem is, as you quite rightly said, there's a big disconnect between, say, the technical complex stuff and um, the, the, average, the average citizen, the average voter. You're not going to find a lot of people, you know, taking time to read a thousand word article in a newspaper, which is really how we used to get information as, as kids. Yeah. I always tell people I gave up a career in cricket to become an economist. I which is technically true. So <laughs> I'll be looking forward to seeing more content <laughs> from you, which explains to me and other people how the economy works. And welcome to the debrief with me, Royal Raymond. I have with me today uh, a retired street cricketer, a failed comedian, and a very respected and serious economist, Deshal Dimel. Hi, Deshal. Hi, Royal. Nice to be here. Thank you for coming on my show. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen you, um, but what people don't know, and I'm going to <laughs> reveal <laughs> to the public today, is that Deshal and I grew up uh, in the sa on the same same street. Uh, he was in the house in front of me, and I was in the house in front of his. <laughs> So I know a lot about Deshal, and since I am on the questioning side of, uh, of this uh, discussion, you don't get to ask me questions <laughs> or raise uh, any embarrassing uh, memories from the past. Uh, but I do want to ask you about the failed cricketer part, mm. because, uh, or the retired cricketer part, uh, because you guys did play a lot of cricket. Uh, that's all I remember. There was about 15 boys down the street, yeah, that's right. uh, if not more, uh, and all you did, all you did was play cricket outside your house, a little further down the road. <laughs> And you all never invited any of the girls <laughs> to play with you. That's true. So I'm very curious, is this like an old-fashioned thing because we are now in our late 30s? Is it just the way society was then? Or <laughs> did you all just like not like us? So what was the story? <laughs> so I think it was pretty much a numbers game, right? As you said, there were like 20 of us boys down the neighborhood, but there were what, you and your sisters, yeah. and I can't remember any other girls in the yeah, area, right? So, girls, yeah. <laughs> so don't blame us, it was purely the demographics of <laughs> Chelsea Gardens. I, if we were to apply this to a political situation, you can't <laughs> use the same excuse. Uh, yeah. And also, given that there were only three girls or four girls, I think I was the only tomboy there. So I doubt <laughs> any of the others would have come and played cricket. Um, but yeah, to move to things more, slightly more serious. Okay, um, the economist part. Um, is that something that you uh, thought you'd ever get into? I know, and I, well, I know, and I'm sure a lot of people know your mum and uh, your dad are both highly qualified. One is a doctor, a surgeon. And oh, yeah. yeah? Physi physician. Physician, and your mum is uh, an educator and had also some kind of uh, political involvement, advice in advisory capacity. Uh, so very well-known people. Um, but you, uh, I remember I kind of grew up with you, uh, were not uh, particularly ambitious, I would say, as a, as a young person. Uh, so how did this change come? Because I, I, you grew up, then you went abroad, and then suddenly you came back as this like very high-flying economist. So what happened in the interim period? So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, my family was full of doctors, right? So my, both my, actually my mother has, was also a, yes. a medical doctor, and okay. she stopped practicing after I was born, so I'm probably to, to blame for that. Um, and my brother is a doctor as well. So I felt like, look, I, I certainly can't go down that right. path. And um, so I thought, okay, what else is out there? 
Um, and at, around that time, my mother was involved in, in, um, in public policy on education. Okay. My grandfather was also a civil servant. Okay. So I guess somewhere along the line, that interest in public policy kind mm. of um, uh, you know, got seeded. Um, and then I really liked, uh, just, I think, geography in mm. Oliver's, even before, uh, before any kind of exposure to economics, that sparked some kind of interest. And then I talk, took up economics for A-levels. And, and from there, I really enjoyed it. Mm. And like all my, soon after university, I started working at the Institute of Policy Studies in um, economic policy analysis work. And from there, I just really loved it. And I just always wanted to be involved in economic policy. Economic policy, was very clear that it was policy that you wanted to be involved with, yeah. It was as a long-term thing, but I also knew that g along the way, it's important to have a broader set of experiences, mm. right? So I wanted to work in, in, uh, in the corporate environment, um, and I was very fortunate to get a chance to do that, um, work for seven years at, uh, at the Haley's, at the mm. Haley's Group. Uh, so that was a really good, you know, uh, again, a, a different perspective from mm. the more academic mm. research mm. angle mm. that I had um, early on. Um, and yeah, so, but yeah, I think, I guess, going forward as well as, you know, where I am right now, it's very much an interest of, uh, of public, po policy, uh, yeah, public of, policy. Yeah, public policy on economic matters. Just to take you back a little bit, I, uh, can you expand a little on when you said corporate experience? Because even my, out of this is my curiosity, because even my experience would be, um, uh, uh, applying econo the applying your economic studies to the to academia or whatever, right? But um, uh, public policy or whatever. But I haven't. I can't say that I know much about what an economist would do in a corporate <laughs> setting. Like, can you explain? I'm curious. I start with a with a odd story. So my first day at uh, at Haley, so I went in thinking, okay, I'm going to be the economist for the group, and then I get my visiting cards, and the visiting card says financial analyst, and I was like, okay. what, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so obviously, the first part of the work I had to do was more kind of general business strategy and things like that. And I had zero background mm. in any kind of finance. So I had to effectively self-learn uh, everything on, on, on finance and on kind of business administration side of things. Um, so it was kind of 50-50. It was working with the group on kind of you know, looking at economic future, mm. how, that, uh, how that applies for uh, business strategies for of, um, mm. of the group companies, of the investment strategy and so mm. on how it applies to treasury management mm. uh, within the group. Uh, but at the same time, also just kind of more um, hardcore financial an analysis and stuff like that. So I'm really glad that that you exposure that was experience. there because it just forced me to learn something new and that's really held me in good stead in the future as well. So you didn't dislike it? Oh, no, no, I loved it. Okay. I thought it was a fabulous experience. <laughs> okay. Because I had initially, I remember when I, in my interview, I, I told my um, future boss at the time, I said, look, I'm probably going to do this for five years and then move on. Yeah. And he's, he's like, that's not what you said in an interview normally. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> but then I, I ended up staying on for even longer than I ended up staying for seven years. Um, and yeah, it was a great experience. I'm really okay. glad to have done that. Um, so also that would work, I would imagine, for conglomerates, but would it work on a, n on a national scale? I know I, I'm assuming a lot of Sri Lankan companies don't use uh, economists in their, you know, to think of business interests locally. Yeah. Uh, does it only apply to bigger companies? Or? Um, it would um, apply to conglomerates that have kind of diverse exposure in different sectors and um, often in different countries as well. Mm -hmm. So Haley's has, for instance, exposure in, across the world. Um, it also applies to companies in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. So say banks or uh, finance companies, uh, trading companies. Um, those entities also require uh, economic analytics, uh, analytic skills. And a lot of, say, banks would have an economic research uh, department or unit that sits alongside their strategy team. Mm. Uh, so it is relatively relatively niche in that sense. You're not going to get, say, for instance, a standalone company that's involved in, you know, just one business line that mm. would need an economist. That's not really, that doesn't yeah. really make sense yeah. to have somebody yeah. or even a team that works uh, mm. full time for you. Just much rather outsource that skill and, you know, get some consultancy from time to time when you need it. Correct. Okay, um, so you went off to the UK to do your um, undergrad yeah. uh, in economics. That's right. Uh, and then you came back, worked with the IPS for a while, and then Haley's at that point, or after you? Haley's, Haley's also. Soon after that, yeah. Okay, so you stayed here for a while, and then you w went, or you did your master's here? I did my master's soon after my, so I did my undergrad, came back, worked at IPS for one year, 
went off and did my masters and then came back to IPS after that. Okay, and masters was also related to economics or? Yeah, it was international political economy. Oh, I tried to avoid the mathsy stuff, so. <laughs> I was going to ask you this, how, how was, was, were you always good at math? No. I mean, you need some part, some, some <laughs> proficiency in that to. Yeah, that was another right? surprise because yeah. uh, at A-levels, economics was, there's hardly any maths, right? Mm. You have a few graphs and stuff thrown in there. In university, it was like 95% maths, 5% kind of intuitive theoretical stuff. Um, so yeah, it, was, it's, it's, it becomes very mathsy. Yeah. Um, and so the interesting thing is that, so in uh, academia, economics does have a very strong quantitative um, angle to it. Uh, and that can, of course, have, you know, it can be applied at, um, at, a, at a practical level when you're working as well. But what you do find is that very often in, say, particularly in a country like Sri Lanka, uh, you're not going to have the data to be able to, you know, do that kind of hmm. uh, modeling. There's a lot of, um, let's say, exogenous factors that affect economic activity, right? So whether it's, it's the, the political side of things, social side of things. Um, so the, the quantitative part has its limitations hmm. in, uh, in practice. Yeah. But in academia, economics is very matchy, and that was really not my strong suit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I do remember you studying for your O levels, actually. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I have to ask you this, were you punished <laughs> or did you like to stand study, uh, study standing up? I used to study in the balcony at Yes, times I remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I yeah, thought you were punishing yourself. Uh, no, I wasn't. It was, it was mainly because I just don't like to stand, to sit still in one place. Yeah. So it's <laughs> uh, also, this is the question I was waiting to ask you. You are a master uh, Spit bubble blower. You used to be, <laughs> you used to be oh, a no. master spit bubble blower. Do you remember this? I do remember this. Oh, it's addictive, right? Because I started doing it as well, and then I mean, this is back in the day. Yeah. Uh, and then you can't stop. It's very, mm -hmm. it's very. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to stop myself now. <laughs> stop. You better not, because uh, it it's very. Uh, I don't know. Some kind of self calming, self soothing thing that happens. So. Uh, Deshal did not expect this today no. with this interview. He thought it was going to be a serious economic interview, but I'm here to reveal everything <laughs> that I know about Deshal. So yeah, he was studying for his O levels, and I remember you getting karate classes also <laughs> on the weekends. Um, but yeah, uh, it's good to know that he's now become this person. Uh, besides that, what I wanted to ask is, um, so okay, okay, at which, which point did you become more um, conscious of what was going on in the country? Because I'm assuming mm. even though your parents were very um, involved in things, children don't really grow no. up with that sort of, you know, and, uh, even not even the knowledge, just not wanting to know. Um, so when you, as you started growing up, I'm assuming maybe this happened when you left the country, where you started being more interested in uh, what was happening back at home, or were you, or did, how, how did it happen? Uh, I guess... I don't know. I mean, growing up in the in the '90s in Sri Lanka, it's difficult to be fully removed from what's going on, right? I mean, when I remember, you know, bomb explosions mm. in when when I was in school, mm. at, you know, right uh, right next door, um, and when that happens, obviously you do have some kind of um, interest and en engagement, even as like a six or eight year old mm. in your own, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. uh, simplistic way. Um, but no, you're right. I mean, uh, you just uh, probably after when I actually started working that I had a more, say, constructive engagement in uh, um, in matters relating to policy and economic policy in in, um, in particular. Until then, it's a much more uh, distant mm. kind of interest, um, but not really a, a focused uh, or, a, or or a more kind of engaged perspective. I think younger people now probably have. A much better level of um, engagement with issues of national interest or mm. issues of um, um, of uh, even political or the or the or the country matters, uh, but I think at that time uh, I don't know if it was just me, but it was a much more distant uh, distant kind of thing. Other than of course the stuff that's really in your face. Yeah, yeah, because I guess access is the biggest difference Absolutely. between the two. Uh, and we spend so much time even at row. I mean, what we're essentially doing is getting that young audience. We're, mm. we're distilling information for them. And we didn't have that. So it was a much, um, I suppose, a more laborious process for us to go and get, get that information Absolutely. and learn on our, uh, on our own. Um, but at which point, uh, in the sense, like at what point did you start digging into Sri Lanka's history, into like mm. how we got here? Um, and how the economic policies led to where we are, because it's very easy to look at the political, uh, I would say the politi politics is the surface. Yeah. Um, so it's easy to look at the politics and what's in the news and imagine that this is uh, certain decisions, uh, political decisions led to where we are, and in, in many ways they do, but there's a 
underlying economic reality that actually is mm. I would feel the truth. Yeah. So do you have, at which point did you realize mm. that A and if you could follow that up with a maybe uh, this is asking a lot but a sort of nutshell of how we got here over sure. the years. Yeah. Yeah, so I think again it was, um, so while I was at IPS there was certain projects that, um, so I initially started working on, on trade economics, which was again not something that I wanted to do, but my boss at the time, Dr. Saman Kalegama, was focused on trade. I was his research assistant, so I was kind of thrown into that. Um, but then later on I got a chance to work on some political economy uh, kind of matters, and there was one particular project that required Going back in, um, going back in Sri Lanka, so I did a lot of reading to try to understand the um, the economic structures that have led um, mm. that have kind of developed in Sri Lanka over the last, I mean, post independence mm. independence period, um, and so we've gone through a lot of very material material shifts, right? So in nineteen uh, up to nineteen seventy seven, it was very much a, um, a immediate post colonial economy focused on a couple of commodities. Um, subject to the um, the variances and the variations that commodities have cycles uh, face in general. Um, and it was post-77 that so Sri Lanka became the first country in the region to liberalize and open up its um, trade and investment practices. So we were uh, pretty much a, a first mover in that, uh, in that sphere. But then subsequently, um, since the 1990s, um, we kind of slowed down in terms of uh, in time, terms of our say engagement with uh, with the global economy. We started to have increasingly um, restrictive practices on on trade, on um, on investment. We became a more inward looking mm. economy. But this kind of happened under the radar mm. because people always had this sentiment that look, Sri Lanka is you know, the most open economy in South Asia, um, and even on say trade, often the barriers would be kind of hidden barriers which you wouldn't mm. necessarily see in the in the data or if you just look at your tariff structures. So um, over the years that, that shift has uh, has taken place and you can see how say exports as a percentage of GDP have come down over over several decades. Um, foreign investment has kind of uh, stagnated. When we've seen countries like say Vietnam, Bangladesh have really taken off in a in a bigger way um, on, on on that path. And you're seeing the impact the kind of manifestations of that in terms of positive um, economic factors in, in some of these countries. Um, so I think that is one of the important shifts that we've seen, seen in Sri Lanka, a kind of initial step towards opening up global engagement, mm. s followed by a kind of more restrictive, um, a restrictive uh, position. Um, and I think that is part of where we are today, right? So in today's context, what we see is um, our biggest challenge is in terms of meeting some of our external uh, debt repayments. But at the same time, we haven't been able to really focus on those inflows. So whilst many other countries have been able to really grow their export sector, be become increasingly attractive for um, FDI and other kind of non-debt create, what we call non-debt creating inflows. Um, in Sri Lanka's case, we haven't been able to do that. So we've seen this kind of expansion of our um, our outflows in terms of our liabilities, but not the same level of expansion of our, our inflows. I think longer term in terms of kind of the, the future path for Sri Lanka's economy ought to kind of switch that around mm. in terms of being able to uh, attract greater levels of inflows into the economy, be that through exports, tourism, remittances, FDI, um, and that will really help us manage our outflows a lot better. I think it's very difficult to to kind of grow as a as an economy if you try if you try to do that by suppressing mm. your imports or suppressing the uh, the payments out because in general the way that the world has changed is that countries no longer say export just one product right mm. they would they would import components put it together assemble and then re-export so exports and imports kind of go hand in hand in mm. that sense mm. so I would think the future trajectory for Sri Lanka probably ought to be more in terms of that greater em embracing or greater engagement with the world so that we get our inflows to be able to match the outflows that we necessarily will have. You know that there was a, there, there is a bunch of intellectuals uh, that, uh, that, that were expected mm -hmm. to um, put the country, set the country on course to, uh, I would imagine, include some of these things that you've talked about that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. If there was a change in government uh, do you believe that even the next lot that come in will bring about these changes? Do they have the vision? Do they have the? Uh, do they even see these problems? Uh, do you think that 
any other government could bring these changes about? So, so I think one of the issues that we have in Sri Lanka is that we keep expecting um, different political actors to provide solutions um, to the to the country's challenges. I think what we need to probably focus more is on investing our resources and energy into the institutions that survive political cycles, right? So you have critical institutions in government, be it uh, the key institutions of the democratic institutions in terms of the judiciary, the parliament, um, or even more fundamentally in terms of the economic institutions like the central bank, the, the treasury, the board of investment. Um, those institutions we are really the institutions that we need to invest in. That's in terms of getting, uh, being able to attract the right talent and to retain that, um, to be able to um, ensure that we have the best access to technology, to information. Um, because when those institutions have strength um, and, and credibility, they are able to survive political changes. And that's really, I would think, the key to bringing in the longer term policy that Sri Lanka really needs. Mm. Um, often what happens is with, naturally with changes in political cycles, you know, there's, a strong, there's a strong incentive to um, uh, undo what, what mm. has been done in the past, right? Mm. And often what happens is you throw out the baby with the bathwater, yeah. you get the good stuff also gets, uh, gets chucked out. Um, so really the key to be able to survive that um, is to have good, robust institutions. Uh, and I think if the, uh, from a voter's perspective also, if that is the kind of thing that voters demand, mm. um, that we you know, make sure that we have strong institutions, we support policies that build up or kind of um, uh, build up our established institutions and make them stronger and more effective, um, for the long term, that's, that's really what we need. Mm. It's not particularly exciting from a kind mm. of you know, political selling point, you know, mm. somebody who goes onto a stage and says, mm. look, I'm going to strengthen the government mm. treasury with better people. Yeah. It's not really great, yeah. right? But, yeah. but that's what we need. Yeah. Um, so and I think that's really what we have to kind of put our energies into. Yeah, and even like even for me, right? I, I'm in my late 30s, as you are, because <laughs> we are the same yes. age, if I remember, right? <laughs> um, it's only in the last, I'd say, four or five years that I started uh, having a sort of a deeper interest in the economy. Up until then, it was news and headlines. Yeah. Um, so even if for me it took this long, I would imagine for many people, many, many, many people, because you are, I mean, you are specialized in your area. Yeah. Um, but for many, many people, even understanding the basics of how an economy runs, how the country runs is... Uh, very far removed from uh, the reality, like they don't have an understanding, and that's the gap that media tries to, well, mm. some media tries to, uh, try to uh, tries to um, stand in. Um, but what do you think is missing in that engagement? Because you have gone, I mean, when you study a, a subject and when you get very deeply into your subject, you move many steps ahead, but you need to necessarily turn back and think from a, the point of view of somebody who has no understanding yeah. of the subject to be able to sell that point to them, right? Uh, I suppose a teacher thinks in, in that mm. way as well. Uh, what do you think is missing in terms of how we engage with the public to make them more conscious of things like this? For instance, uh, uh, talking about strengthening institutions over, um, you know, giving your vote to a politician who says that he will. Uh, I do think the media does have an important role in that. Um, and oftentimes, again, it's uh, it's like reporting on that kind of stuff is not the not the stuff that sells magazines or sells you airtime, right? Mm. So uh, there is a there is a rec there is a necessity for um, media to be able to kind of go beyond, say, what is commercially attractive and mm. serve what is really a, 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 a very legitimate need of of society. I think the problem is, as you quite rightly said, there is a big disconnect between, say, the technical complex stuff and um, the, the average, average yeah. the average citizen, the average voter. Um, so I think really there is a, a skill required to be able to convey that information that is easily relatable, easily understandable, um, and then actionable. Um, and I think we've we've started to see that to some extent with uh, with the, the expansion of social media mm. in the in the country mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but there again, then the issue is that you're not always going to have objective. Mm. Um, evidence put in put mm. in front of you, right? So there has to be again the ability to, to discern mm. what is um, uh, what is not driven by agenda mm. versus what is something that is being put out there to uh, push a particular uh, a particular angle. Um, so yeah, so certainly the the role of media, education in general, mm. right? So yeah, I think I it's gonna. it's critical that uh, even at school level, 
um, students in general get exposed to some of these crucial uh, mm. issues in in public life and mm. it doesn't mean that you need to be somebody who's going to engage who wants exactly. to become a professional economist yeah. or yeah. somebody wants to you know engage in that sphere professionally but mm. to have that awareness in terms mm. of being able to understand these other factors that are mm. important um, uh, important for mm. the country economically for the country socially politically uh, that basic level of understanding is uh, is is really yeah. crucial yeah. so it's really a, a cross i mean it's a, it's a education is not something that finishes when you go to school right mm. so yeah. when you when you finish school i mean i still i'm constantly learning new things That's in correct. my sphere as well um so i think yeah i think it's a it's a role there's the role for media the role for educators and for schools universities mm. um think tanks civil mm. society mm. it's a lot of different actors that have a role in this and do you think uh, do you see it happening do you see civil society and uh, reformers getting actively involved in this i think there's some activity right yeah? there is there is increasing yeah. activity and again leveraging social media in a way mm. that is uh, useful mm. for that's okay you're not going to find a lot of people you know taking time to read a thousand word article in a newspaper which is really how we used to get information as as kids of course i started with the sports page and then we <laughs> moved uh, <laughs> i can't believe you were that serious about cricket you guys were really serious about it i always tell people i gave up a career in cricket to become an economist I, which is technically true i yes, mean true. not that i, I was skilled enough one but bump, <laughs> i remember you guys playing one bump uh, on rainy days yeah uh, yeah you were very serious about that you're on social media Uh, But you only make jokes on it. <laughs> That's true. So you need to start Fair, engaging. Failed comedian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to get to that also. Uh, so on November, when is it? November fifth. That's right. Every yeah. year, November fifth, every year for the last I don't know how long, uh, the Shahal posts the same joke, uh, incomplete joke, uh, or that's the joke uh, every year. So. Um, <laughs> that's the comedy aspect uh, but no i think uh, honestly see uh, deshal there's a lot of media interest in you uh, in the sense that i'm not saying you're yohani <laughs> but <laughs> what i mean is as uh, as a younger generation more accessible economists mm-hmm. and uh, you're able to make it less um, less technical less uh, you know academic and fuddy duddy and that whole you know that whole idea that uh, economics or very tough t- subjects are, mm-hmm. ha- have wrapped around them um so because you're engaging and accessible i think that uh, you should uh, do more seriously okay <laughs> <laughs> i'm not scolding you but i'm just saying no no i agree uh, i agree you know like i think you'll have a big audience because uh, what i'm trying to say is that uh, i hate the word influencer um because yeah because influence applies to certain things that i i'm not a part of but i think in every sphere there are certain mm-hmm. influences so even in economics or whether it's news or whatever um even with journalism it's moved into what they call the fourth est- uh, from the fourth estate mm. it's moved to the fifth estate okay where um it's the proems so pro- professionals and amateurs are working together mm. and how influencers okay. are now no- not necessarily journalists um but other people online uh it can can work together with journalists as well so um because social media is so uh important mm. today i feel that people can really people like you within your own spheres can become let's not use the word influencer <laughs> but influencers <laughs> without the r mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so i'll be looking forward to seeing more content from you which explains to me and other people how the economy works and what's happening uh in um less obtuse language uh that we can actually uh understand um yeah so that's basically some of the questions i wanted to ask you and i think just to uh sum up uh recently married mm-hmm. or has it been a year or more no it's been two and a half years two now. and a half years yeah uh because the pandemic took two years from us yes uh, i'm going to say recently married fair enough recently <laughs> married uh three plus dogs or three dogs three dogs three dogs, three dogs. uh what are your future plans besides stargazing <laughs> <laughs> well survival is the the immediate plan yeah. um no so i mean i'd i'd like to continue to engage in um in kind of economic policy mm. in uh, in sri lanka I'm more of a behind the scenes guy a technical guy so i like to uh get involved more from that uh, you know that i'm behind the scenes too by the yeah. way but i was pushed in front <laughs> so i think it's time i start pushing you uh, to get in front of the camera and start doing some more so okay tell me i bump <laughs> no 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 worries uh yeah so i mean that's that's my that's my passion so right now i have um 
I work with a with a with a think tank, Verita Research. I I work uh, also with a number of companies. So I have a bit of a balance between policy oriented work and also the corporate side of things. And that that's worked quite well for me um, right now. But yeah, going forward, I mean that um, I'd always have an interest in uh, economic policy for uh, for Sri Lanka and whichever form that uh, that takes. I think that's something that I'd always want to be involved in and just ways that we can continue to improve um, and do the best for this country. This may be a question uh, you didn't expect. Would he ever get into politics? No, I don't think so. You don't think so? <laughs> but he said, I don't think so. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Uh, you might be the new Dr. Harsha going, <laughs> going forward. Um, so yeah, it was great catching up with you. I don't think we've had a proper conversation in like yeah, years. True. So. Uh, or ever probably, <laughs> <laughs> you were the boy from uh, in front that uh, at that awkward stage where yeah. of life where you don't really talk to boys uh, or the other way around. Anyway, thanks so much, Dishal, for coming on. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourself and uh, hope to see more of you. Thank you, Rohit. It's a great pleasure.